Now, last video, I got sidetracked a little bit, and we didn't get to the subject that I wanted to get to, and so we're going to look at that subject today. And that's the correlation between uh, the Port Huron uh, Golf Club Clubhouse and uh, a murder of a country western star that was known quite well locally. If you recall, the clubhouse was foreclosed upon and it was sold to some folks in Muttonville, Michigan. I believe they're Polish immigrants, but I'm not real sure. It was renamed the White Eagle Hall, but eventually the owner would be this fellow right here, Lonnie Barron. Lonnie Barron was a rockabilly singer who was known as the Michigan Elvis. He was also known as the Mississippi Farm Boy. It's been written that Lonnie Barron was born in a one-room cabin on a cotton field in the northern part of Louisiana. Lonnie's father was a sharecropper, which did not make things too easy for the family. He first sang in church with his mother. When he was just 12 years old, he got himself work with his neighbors so he could pay for a guitar that cost the then princely sum of $4.98. It was from his roots to Mississippi that fans came to know him as a Mississippi farm boy. When Lonnie turned 16, his parents allowed him to join the U.S. Air Force and he eventually ended up at Selfridge Air Force Base. During his free time, Barron worked odd jobs hitchhiking to country music shows in Detroit. In 1951, he participated in Stairways to the Stars, an amateur talent show on a Detroit television station. He followed that by winning the Ted Mack Amateur Hour three times. His military service ended in 1952. He began hosting a radio program over WSDC, Marine City, seven days a week. And Barron performed song requests with his guitars, spun records, interviewed local musicians, and read listeners' letters. Although determined to make a living as an entertainer, Barron took on sales jobs around Mount Clemens, where he rented a room for $7 a week. George and Mary Dragna, the owners of Dutch's Long Cabin Nightclub in Port Huron, listened to Barron's radio shows regularly. After noticing he had missed a few days of broadcast, Mary Dragna searched through Mount Clemens and found Barron in his car with the flu. The Dragnas took him into their home and nursed him back to health. Once Barron recovered, the Dragnas told him to return to his rented room in Mount Clemens and offered him $15 to perform at Dutch's every Monday night. With money borrowed, Barron found the White Eagle Hall in Gratiot Road in Muttonville. The owners, Polish immigrants, wanted $20,000 for the hall, 10 acres of land, and a small cottage next door. The cottage next door would be Lonnie's home. It was here at White Eagle's Hall, the old clubhouse of the Fortune Golf Course, that Lonnie and the band performed a stage show, played music for round and square dances, hosted guest stars, and maintained a family-friendly, all-ages scenario. No alcohol was allowed on the premises. He was very strict. He didn't smoke or even drink water in the bandstand. Aaron also broadcast from WHLS Radio, Port Huron, for a while. Singing at the White Eagle Hall with his band was very successful and Lonnie started making records. Lonnie's records sold well in Michigan and Ohio. As his fame spread, he appeared on shows with Johnny and Jack, Kitty Wells, Webb Pierce, Baron Young, and Jim Reeves. Baron performed on the WSM Ernest Tubb Midnight Jamboree in Nashville, and things were going well for him. By the start of 1956, Baron's career seemed on track for success. He wrote his own song. He studied the music industry. He played shows across the Midwest, Mid-South, and Southwest Ontario, and he cultivated friendships with fellow entertainers. Barron got into the game with the big boys when he recorded Teenage Queen, a hot rockabilly with swinging steel guitar, recorded in Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs>
Honey Barron's musical career was suddenly cut short in early 1957 when the husband of a woman he suspected was having an affair with Lonnie shot and killed him. The newspaper reported friends of the victim as saying he did not have an enemy in the world, but that means what it usually does in the papers. He did, one with a gun. His name was Roger Fetting, a jobless carpenter who confessed to the murder. Roger's wife was a great fan of Lonnie, and she wrote Lonnie love letters. But Roger found one she did not mail, and a story. Here's a headline in the Detroit Free Press. It says he shot Singer for dating his wife. And here's a headline in the Port Huron Times Herald. Betting admits killing held on manslaughter. Here's one more newspaper clipping that lays out the story pretty well, and you can read this at your leisure by just pausing your DVD player. Lonnie Barron's body lied in state at the Robert Harley Funeral Home in Port Huron. Most of us remember this funeral home as it was years later as the Elliott Funeral Home. And that's the hospital in the background. It's reported that over 3,500 fans passed by the funeral home to pay their last respects to Lonnie. He was dressed in a white gabardine cowboy suit with red piping, which had become his trademark. His body was then taken to Richton, Mississippi, near his father's home where he was buried. Hundreds more fans and perhaps some curious folks attended the last rites at the small cemetery. During the spring of 1957, Barron's friends held concerts at the White Eagle Hall to raise money for the purchase of a granite grave marker. Delano Works in Minnesota designed a five-foot-wide monument, but the price wasn't met through the donations and the stone was scaled down to about half that size. Etched below a graphic adaptation of Barron's signature read his favorite motto, the only way to have friends is to be a friend yourself. Well, how in the world did we get from the Port Huron High School Golf Club, which is what started this uh, last couple of videos, to the murder of Lonnie Barron? Well, I think if you think about it, you'll figure it out. There is one more thing I'd like to share with you before we leave this area. You can see the golf course on the left and the beach on the upper right, but in the middle there where the arrow is, that's what we want to look at right now. This would be the street view. At, uh, that's what's there today. But this is what used to be there. A motel. Well, back then they called it a motor court. The Holland Shady Motor Court. The motor court's name certainly describes that there's a lot of shade there because there's a lot of trees. But here's another photograph that gives you a little different view and the same color. All right, I think it's about time we get back to the yearbook again. In 1924, Fort Huron High School first introduced tennis in the form of interclass games at Pine Grove Park. This was played senior versus juniors and included both girls and boys. It wasn't until 1930 when Port Huron High joined the Southwest Michigan League that a formal boys tennis team was formed. A steady team wasn't fielded until the Eastern Michigan League was formed in 1945. Once that happened, Port Huron High School had steady competition and coaches. The team had only four tennis courts in town they could use. The tennis courts they used were White Park, Pine Grove, Gratiot Park, and Lincoln Park. The one you're looking at here was in Pine Grove Park. And as interest grew, once again, the Port Huron District Foundation came to the rescue and built Memorial Park. Memorial Park had eight lighted tennis courts. The big red tennis teams were very successful and won numerous Eastern Michigan League and regional championships. We're not going to look at all the sports at the high school, just the ones I have some old pictures of I thought you might enjoy. The high school track team started about 1930. 
I've got a couple of photos here I thought was really interesting because it was played on the Port Huron Athletic Field that was on Griswold Street. And the reason I know that, if you look in the background, you can see that eight foot wood fence that went around it. And also the uh, grandstand. Here are a couple more old photos showing the, uh, this one showing the start of the half mile race. And in this one here, uh, you can see the, the finish of the 220 yard race. You can also see better the, uh, the board fence that went up around the uh, field. And you can also see the grandstand here. Hockey is probably one of the newest programs at Port Huron High School. It began in the 1977-78 season due to the generation of people at McMoran Arena who donated the equipment and ice time for practice and games. But I imagine those hockey players were disappointed because hockey was dropped the following year and did not return until the 1984-85 school year. The reason I wanted to show you this is because on Port Yarn's uh, history page of sports, they show this picture right here for hockey. There's no caption, no information, nothing about the year was taken. It's not a very clear picture, but it's certainly an unusual picture for a hockey team. If you look at the fellows laying on the ground, those hockey sticks are pretty short. And the fellow standing on the left looked like he has a cricket bat in his hand. And the fellow in the middle looks like he has a, a catcher's a chest protector. Which would be alright, I guess, for the goalie. Just unusual is all. But certainly historical, that's what it is. We've looked at a lot of different sports and every team at a school has to be called something, have a name, a logo. And of course, at Fort Huron High School, ours was the Big Reds. Today, that's probably not politically correct. I can't see ever changing it though. And Big Red, of course, referring to Big Red and Indian, or an Indian chief, however you want to look at it. But the logo has changed over the years, so let's just take a look at how it's changed. It's hard to believe, but the big red logo wasn't always the high school logo. They were also called uh, something else with a different type of logo, and that something else is right here. Port Huron High School Bulldogs. Well, at least I think that's a bulldog. And you can see in this 1907 yearbook, they have that bulldog right on the front cover. I think I showed you this picture once before, but I didn't really have the story behind it. The early teams never got a letter, uh, no PH to put on a sweater. In 1908, a committee was formed to choose 11 players to receive red and white sweaters. And that's what you're looking at here. These fellows in the first two rows have their red sweaters with the white striping on the sleeves. The fellows above uh, in the last row or the top row uh, didn't receive sweaters. They only gave out 11 of them. And they were given to the players that had played in the majority of the games. And this would be the precursor to the modern athletic varsity letter. On October 29, 1915, a mass meeting was held in the auditorium. Crimson blankets with a high school monogram was presented to the football team. The monogram is one of the oldest logos known to date used for the Port Huron High School. It doesn't say that this was a team blanket or individuals. I think it was individual because they used the word plural. And that blanket is what you see in front of the team. During this era, Port Huron High School begins to issue the well-known interlocking PH as an athletic letter. In the 1905 yearbook, it is stated which members will receive the black letters and caps. Team photos often were taken with members donning their beloved sweaters, while newcomers wear them without. These sweaters should not be confused with the actual uniforms worn on the field. In this photograph, you see both logos. You see the earlier logo of the fellow on the right, and the current logo uh, the fellow on the left. Today you have varsity jackets. But back when I was going to school, they didn't even know what a varsity jacket was. All we had were sweaters, either cardigan or a pullover. 
I didn't play sports from the 10th grade on because I, I couldn't. I had to go to work at the age of 14. We didn't come from a wealthy family and every little bit helped. Today, the freshman class is the low end of the totem pole. But when I was going to Garfield, we were at the high end of the totem pole because really, we were the oldest class in the school. We were like the seniors. And so it was a big deal to get our varsity letter. And the team voted who would get a varsity letter and who would get a minor letter. I think we all voted for all the guys to get varsity letters. And most of the fellows at Garfield had cardigan sweaters with the G on the side. Green cardigan sweaters, white G on the side. It was cool. Of course, that letter is only about half the size as the varsity letters are today. Join me in my next video, and we'll see what there is to see.